Hello and welcome to the 108th episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Thursday the 9th of January 2020 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This week we have fellow Emancipation Network comrade Grant from Swampside Chats and his Antipodean friend David Rylance on the show to discuss Gary Teeple's really brilliant book, Marx's Critique of Politics. This is the first of a three-parter, the last instalment of which will be a Patreon episode. Teeple's book is really a Marxist tour de force in my opinion, and all good Marxists looking at the tawdry state of left politics today would do well to read it. We go off on a Brexit slash UK election tangent in this episode towards the end, but don't worry, we return with great unfettered force to the main theme in the following episodes. This week I have the new patrons Emil and Neil Smith to thank. You too can join the Patreon gang gang for only $5 a month, which works out at only $1 an episode. Patrons get access to all the old patron bonus episodes, the right to vote on the reading group series, and other cool stuff too. If you'd like to help out with editing or producing the show, please hit me up on Twitter or Facebook. I'm currently deep in preparation for the upcoming 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon reading series. As they say, après le McNair, le Brumaire. If you'd like to comment on the show, please do so on the YouTube channel and make sure to like, subscribe and share. You can also join me on Facebook or Twitter too. Okay, to the discussion. Grant, where the hell did you come across this Gary Teeple book? You're the one who put me onto it. Uh, I think I came across this book through David, actually, right? Probably. Yeah, well, I recommended it to you, yeah. So David, where the hell did you come across it? This is some obscure book. Yeah, well, basically, um, the way I came across through it is uh, through someone called um, Tad Teets. He's an Australian Marxist a psychiatrist. He keeps a blog called Left Flank. I, I knew him through Facebook. And basically, for a long period of time, he was advocating, I guess, anti politics on his Facebook, not proselytizing about it, but um, I'd say it was more like trolling. <laughs> and um, it kind of, I guess, it, the nature of the analysis that he was offering was both maddeningly infuriating <laughs> to, to, a, to a leftist, but was troublingly insightful and acute in terms of like predicting the way things were unfurling. This was about, this was in the year leading up to Trump winning the presidency. Might have been a little bit before that. I'm not really sure. But um, basically, over time, I became more kind of interested, but probably in actually more inclined in a sense of trying to counter this, you know, the, uh, the idea of, of being able to adopt a anti-political stance or position can we define anti-political well i think probably the first thing to do would be to define what we mean by politics right grant you had a very nice um succinct definition of it that's right so i think politics can be conceived of as the management of social antagonisms i think that that actually when you when you parse it through that that even holds down to the smallest village right but then the modern political state is the material foundation for politics under capitalism, and private property is the foundation of the political state. Yeah, and so in that sense, anti-politics, like if we were to boil it down, I guess, to... um, It it would involve the resolution of social contradictions. Well, that's right. It's certainly not the management thereof. And I think probably the provocative element of it is particularly, especially in regards to the left, that it's suggesting that what is considered to be revolutionary transformation of social antagonisms, in actual fact, even in the revolutionary form, ends up being management thereof, just in a uh, a politically rather than socially emancipatory sense. There's actually a great quote from um, Marx in an article, Critical Notes on the article, The King of Prussia and Social Reform by a Prussian, uh, where he says that... The state will never discover the source of social evils 
wherever there are political parties, each party will attribute every defect of society to the fact that its rival is at the helm of the state instead of itself. Even the radical and revolutionary politicians look for the causes of evil, not in the nature of the state, but in a specific form of the state, which they would like to replace with another form of the state. And I think it's really important that basically Marx is defining the state as the political state. Like this is fundamental to how he understands the modern slash capitalist mode of production based state. So when he says that the even the revolutionary politicians pretty much want to replace the state with another state, I guess that the, the tendency would therefore may perhaps be to read a commerce like to emphasize the anti-statism of that criticism. But it's not simply just an anti-statism, or maybe even necessarily primarily an anti-statism. It's an anti-politicism. It's about the necessarily alienated nature of the state as a material reality being predicated on its separation. It's standing over and against society. So this is the idea that the the state is somehow managing these contradictions between it, but always with the respect to maintaining itself and maintaining that that status that 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 those contradictions between the classes. Well, I think the thing is, is that civil society itself, the very fact of civil society, which is predicated in private property, if in effect insists upon some kind of state. And so even when, for example, you have efforts to quote unquote abolish the state, uh, what ends up happening is you end up with some kind of parastate or a, a substitutionary political entity that might not call itself a state, but effectively operates as such. In a real life example, Gaddafi's quote unquote socialism offers a pretty um, interesting example of a so-called a stateless administration that actually operates like purely like a state. Right. Muammar Gaddafi's kind of, oh, there's no state here. I'm just guiding the revolution type of thing in Libya. It, it actually reminds me of you know, a kind of, and this, this isn't to culture war against anarchism. I will, I will certainly be talking plenty of shit against Marxists as well. But, you know, it reminds me of anarchism where, you know, you have Bakunin who goes like, we've abolished the state, you know, by decree, right? Or, or you have, oh no, uh, we're not in charge. We're just the warlords who hang out around these villages, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. You know, there's always that anarchist political class necessary <laughs> after the revolution in a lot of these conceptions. Well, in some sense, anarchism, and I'm sure that this will, would cause a lot of shade from anarchists, but um, having once been one myself, anarchism is actually, in some sense, takes the principle of politics to its extreme in the sense that it so, is so idealistically attached to politics that it, its fundamental vision is to actually even do away with the state in order to preserve politics, which is not actually a possibility. But nonetheless, that's what it's... Uh, it's um, Right, we're going to universalize politics. Everybody gets to be in the meeting. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right, exactly. There's a certain kind of, um, I guess, uh, inability to grasp that the, you can't, in effect, have a proletarian state. It doesn't, it does, it, fundamentally, the state itself is not amenable to being run by um, the majority. Well, that's right. I mean, it's it's not it's not amenable to being run. Also, too, I think, in order to be run as a proletarian state, it has to be run for proletarians, and it's that difference between run being run as and being run for that you find the continuation of the very division that the proletarian revolution is meant to overturn. Explain what you mean there. You're saying that you know a future utopian Marxist society doesn't have state-like features because the majority is in control. No, I think the, I think the, the, the thing to emphasize is that basically Marx and Engels, insofar as they offer any succinct definition of what's meant to replace politics, it's what they call the administration of things. And the, the replacement of politics with administration isn't meant to be about the replacement of politics with technocratic bureaucracy, although that certainly is one approach to trying to suspend or surpass politics. In some ways, a Bolshevik revolution is highly technocratic <laughs> in this sense. I think that the emphasis on administration has a lot to do with 
not so much like, for instance, I guess when people think about anti-statism, it sort of like becomes a thing about anti-centralization, anti-institutionalism. Don't necessarily think that's the that's really off, off Marx and Engels, like of interest in or concern to Marx and Engels. I don't think that that's it's like it's not that the um, well, in fact, I think that they they see certain decentralization as actually a kind of balkanization that clogs up the free movement of society. Mm, mm, yeah, totally, totally agree with that. I think it's much more to do with the relationship between labor and administration. So, with politics and with the state, it in a sense, it there's no social responsivity and obligation to administering the logistical organization and the freedom of association in labor in a way which is actually in the interests both individually and collectively yeah absolutely and a little a little heard synonym for communism that marx uses is the free association of producers and i think that's actually a wonderful term right you have to go into your daily life the way now we go into this oppressive institution of work and you have to have the tools of social administration at your disposal, directly through your participation in social production. So it's through this you have that idea of the individual and the collective will unifying. Is that what you're saying, Grant? Well, the individual and the collective, there, there is a sense of, of, of reconciling those things or, or abolishing that antagonism as a material reality that exists under capitalist civil society. But it's not about the individual being absorbed by the collectivity. In fact, the, the collectivity can only be an expression of particulars, right? And so that... That actually, I think, too, really, um, you know, and th th that, I think, that collective individual thing, right, that has has some place, if you were to come up with a definition of politics, that has some place in it as well. Not quite as central as what we were saying earlier, but that disalignment between those things and, and then the actual way forward is people acting on, on their individual interests socially. Right. Like that's actually a process in which we arrive at communism. Yeah. I mean, I think the thing is that basically in civil society, the atomization that civil society universalizes effectively renders us in the private sphere, seeking out egoistically. And I don't mean I really mean that in the sort of the monadic sense, like, you know, of like a like in, in a sense of being a pure unit to egoistically seek out our self-interest. And then, of course, the only sphere or place in which to commune quote-unquote social self-interests is in the political sphere which is the material basis of which is the state and so basically you end up with this and so the public private division is also part of what is effectively recreated through and predisposed by politics and so i guess the the thing that sort of stands out is that when people associate in a way which is emancipatory they begin to act in not just their self-interest or their political interests, but their social self-interests. The so-called, the, the apparent contradiction between self-interest and sociality is actually practically merged in the form of what Marx calls the real movement, but then when it organises itself, we call a social movement. And, and yeah, and so that in that the 1840s critique of Hegel on the modern state, you know, there is that establishment of this idea that politics purports to be this place where we can work on universal issues, you know. But in actuality, what happens in politics is very alienated from everyday social life. And that may be a disputable comment to most people on the left, but I think if you ask most people, they would say so, right? And political participation, even of the radical sort, ends up about this abstract realm of universality in a way that actually tries to shortcut accomplishing things in real society. So notice, for example, you know, how the civil rights movement in the United States is strategy for ending segregation involved making interventions into daily life. Actually, you know, taking the reins of the modern state, it doesn't let you use your political willpower to magically reshape society. You can see this in the Soviet Union, too, that no matter how much power they had or wanted to have, they weren't able to establish a stable new mode of production. 
And so to say, though, that politics is alienated, it doesn't mean we shouldn't pay attention to what happens politically as a distorted reflection of social events, right? You know, sometimes when you bring up anti-politics to people, they go, oh, well, you think about politics. Gotcha. You know, but but politics as a displacement from your daily life might actually impede your ability to fight capitalism where it actually abridges your own social interests. You know, that the idea really is that, you know, the people who already agree with you, right, the people on the left, those might not actually be the people in your, your everyday existence who you have real opportunities to fight the abridgment of your interests by capitalism with. Which is an important point because there's, in, particularly the more that the um, left has lost any social base to speak of that, except the very narrow withered social base of those who commit their social practice purely and entirely to politics, they have become more and more hostile to associations that actually are not purely with the left itself. So, you know, the very fact that, for example, you know, just as Grant said, your actual associations in relation to your self-interests in society may not involve leftists by and large, and more importantly, may not involve being able to convert the people that are involved in it and share those social self-interests into leftists, ideologically speaking, becomes a sort of, well, I mean, it, 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 it becomes a ground of um, almost definitionally a fragmentary uh, and a grounds for schism and division, castigation, admonition. Right, right. And you're holding, you're holding people to these political identity benchmarks that aren't one probably aren't that important to accomplishing whatever social goal you're you're pursuing and then because you're posing communism as a political question oftentimes when people do this they actually end up behind the people in their daily life not just oh you know like i'm i'm alienating myself from them but they actually miss the ways that the people in their daily life are you know i don't know if the word radical is quite right but are moving things in the right direction, perhaps more, perhaps more so than people who have thrown all of their lives into political activity. I mean, I think it's partly the reason why we're often so taken like, entirely by surprise when a social uh, radical moment, which is much more spontaneous, admittedly, than in the past, but when it erupts, like almost across the left, like almost universally across the left, it's, it's taken by surprise when these things happen. They almost like they happen obscurely and mystically. Even, you know, no one can predict when they're going to occur. And it's like, yes, they're spontaneous, but they do have lead up. And it's got a lot to do with the fact that the left is just not, it's not socially attached to... It's not embedded. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's not socially attached. Well, even at the level, I guess, of, of just even um, having a kind of um, organisational experience of the same kind of daily conditions which then you can see a slowly but surely generating something. You might not be able to pinpoint the exact time, but, you know, you can tell that something's coming. I mean, I think it's interesting because there was, um, in Egypt, leading up to um, the Arab Spring, there was some, I think it was, I think it was, I mean, some academics, I remember, who had written prior to it erupting. But it spent a lot of time basically engaged in ethnographic research. I'm trying to think of the name of, of one of the books I'm thinking of, but it's not coming to mind. They, after spending a, a lot of time engaged in ethnographic research, and this they, they, they're, they're writing this, I think it was published after it happened, the book I'm thinking of, but was written before, clearly presages something's going to happen here. And it's, it's sort of like, I guess it's that, and the, it's not, there's not, not some sort of theoretical formula that's been allowed, that's allowed them to have this sort of, brilliantly predictive insight it's that they've engaged ethnographically with the texture of everyday life and therefore been able to grasp just in a at the level of of being able to observe not even just it's not even just the intolerability of material conditions because those of themselves don't necessarily predict that something's going to happen socially soon but able to see the the way in which the associational experience of conditions in Egypt was reaching some kind of critical mass. Like, we've just had the election in the UK and, like, this whole massive decay of the Labour vote in the Labour northern heartlands, you know, the mining pit towns. And for me, it's like a devastating example of 
the difference between the political and the social. In those communities, they have historical memory of a social existence, you know, social link to the Labour Party, say. But that's gone with the high bike. You know, they may see somebody once every five years, a canvasser going, will you vote for me, please? You know, and after a while, like, your your granny dies and you're going, oh, fuck it, I'm going to vote Tory. You know what I mean? Mm. Well, I mean, I think this is that, of course, I, 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 said, I think it's a, it's a crucial point to, to, to focus on, that new Labour and Blairism in the UK and, you know, the, the general shift to third wayism is sort of treated as being the thing that, effectively betrays an earlier, a stronger workers, socialistically oriented uh, laborism, and that it effectively, you know, hollows it out and leaves us with the sort of situation that we have now. The, the trouble is, is that in actual fact, it, this almost seems to dodge or avoid the fact that it's the actual, and particularly the, 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 the key turning point is from the late 60s through to the early 80s in terms of the uh, behavior of the unions. And it's the way in which the unions, which have, by this point, well stepped, not just beyond become being civil institutions, which in itself, right? They've 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 already become they've already gone from advancing social self interest to being civil socially civil social institutions and economic means, regulators more or less. Yeah, yeah. Then they move there from there through the seventies to becoming basically to pretty much co-opting them, their, their, themselves as institutions to the managerial demands of the political state. And in so doing, they effectively destroy themselves as political vehicles for, for workers. And so what you see is even before, I mean, Blairism or third wayism sets in, there's the, the pretty much the collapse, you know, the ongoing unravelling of union membership. And it's this union institutionality which is that which is exactly that thing that you know was the difference between you know an ongoing experience of being quote unquote represented both in the political sphere and also however advocated for in the civil sphere and what you have now where it's like you know like as, as you just said tom you know you have every five years you know your labor candidate sort of shows up shakes the tin to, you know to so, you know, to get to be re-elected to parliament and then, you know, it's like, and then pretty much abandons you again. Or, I mean, it's even the fact that, like, I guess what I'm trying to say is in some ways, if, if it wasn't the case that the political arm of the Labour movement wasn't already doing that to some degree, and it's just that the experience of the, the unions and the um, associational links between workers themselves gave a kind of thickened sense that, that there was, you know, Labour that the Labour Party took an interest in, you know, in their uh, a much more closer and fine-grained interest in them as a, a social base. I think if it's not the, ca- the f- case that that you know you still in some ways really only saw your representative, you know, once every five years, it was only really because the civil institutions themselves insisted upon more political re- responsivity and more of a political connection. And so, in some ways, this is exactly this is exactly what happens when, if we're talking here specifically about labour, when the the labour arm of the political class finds itself increasingly floating free of its social base. I mean, in, at first, in some sense, particularly when it gets back to power under Blair, it's actually kind of like a it's a bit of a euphoric experience for it because it can actually go ahead and and govern without the the disciplinary pressure and the ongoing need to socially I try to say, um, to have to govern around, you know, its own social base. It finds itself, effectively, it both has the vote and is liberated from having to respond to it. It's a halcyon time, you know, for politicians in that sense. It's why they, you know, they, they look back on it as being sort of like <laughs> the heyday of, like, of their political experience. But that's the thing is, it couldn't last. And in, and, and in that sense, it, what happens is, is, although that's an adaption, so effectively Blairism is, is almost like a necessary adaption. If Labour was ever going to get back to power, it was going to be through something like Blairism or the third way. And, but when it does, it effectively, if, if, if the aim was for it to be a preserver or to be a sort of, to, to kind of like provide the means to um, re-aggregate, reconcentrate a social movement of workers, well, that absolutely doesn't happen. Instead, it accelerates the political unwinding. Of laborism. I have a question for you, David. Then you said that in the sixties to the seventies that the unions. You said they. I'm trying to get my wording exactly correct here. You said that they did something 
they acted at the behest of the political. Did you say that? Uh, what I said was that basically through from, you know, basically like late 60s, we're talking about 69, sort of 68, 69 through to, um, you know, the early 80s. I think probably if you had to pick a, a milestone, maybe the pilot strike and, and of course the miners strike, I suppose, in, in the UK. So it might actually go a bit later, I guess. Although oh, actually it was sorry. Well, I guess actually because I'm just thinking the miners strike in some ways is a rearguard movement or something that's already happened, I guess. Anyway, sorry. Uh, I think that, yeah, so basically what I'm trying to get at is that so what happens is, is during that time is the the unions effectively find themselves having to decide between their already civil institutional role as workers representatives and their attachment as political representatives of the workers movement, quote unquote, in respect to the Labour Party as well as the state uh, or, you know, whatever the Socialist Party or whatever left wing side of politics exists in a particular circumstance. And they opt to... Um, to take upon themselves the responsibility, quote unquote, of engaging in the political management of the workers' movement. And in, I mean, you see it in, in the UK in the sense that long before Thatcher comes along and supposedly, you know, introduces neoliberalism or whatever, the, the, the grounds for this, the grounds for it are laid in the way in which not just the Labour Party, but the union movement itself is divided against itself or operates to try and impose upon the workers' movement accommodation or adaptation to, you know, the oh, like, I guess, uh, the economic changes of the 70s, quote unquote, in the winter of discontent and such. And so, I mean, you know, and I think it's interesting too, like in Australia, Australia is a, a pretty interesting example of it because in Australia, it's not the right that leads the so-called neoliberalisation, it's the left. And particularly more important, I mean, more fundamentally is that it's, it's the unions, like almost fundamentally themselves, who actually enter into the political sphere and then lead it in this direction. I mean, the prime minister is uh, that we have that does this, um, Bob Hawke, he is the head of the Australian Council of Labour Unions, takes the leadership of the Labour Party, comes to power and effectively then begins to introduce, with the full cooperation of, of the Labour movement, a uh, Labour movement, sorry, I meant to say, well, like the, the, the unions, the representatives of the Labour Union, Labour movement, begins to introduce what was called the Accord which effectively was about suppressing wages. And supposedly the offset of doing that was that the state would then create a social wage, which was to be manifested in the form of universal free health care. So reestablishing Medicare, which had been abolished, providing welfare benefits of, of you know, various kinds. Pretty much basically the idea of, you know, pretty much in some sense, a socialistic argument, a state socialistic argument was used as the means to repress workers' wage increases you know, pretty much uh, to stop the wage inflation spiral that were, they were dealing with, that they, that they needed to get a handle on. And so it's interesting because, of course, what ends up happening is the accord sold out and none of the, you know, none of the projected overall gains, which were supposedly meant to offset, because fundamentally with the accord too, it wouldn't have made any sense ultimately if the, if the state had delivered what it said it was going to deliver, there would have been no ultimate gain in engaging in that wage suppression. And so it's it's interesting that, like, in, in a sense, the promise of a more socially responsive state becomes the means for... Dismantling the actual social... Yeah, and, 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 and it's right, and suppressing um, workers very militantly. I mean, and, 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 and obviously, to, and to a degree, too, with enough, with enough power to cause a lot of strife in the functioning of the economy from pursuing just their like their direct social self-interest, which is increasing the amount of return they get for their labour, like directly. And, it, and there's a lot to be said, I think, even now about the ways in which, like, say, for example, like seeking wage increases is done through things like trying to lift the minimum wage, or even the way in which, like, there's, with the left, there's a lot of emphasis on social movements oriented towards state programs. But, like, the idea fundamentally, for instance, that we might be wanting to focus on the wage and, but how it is that society might come to find an associational strength, which can press towards something that is in there. It was like, at least certainly at least to begin with is, is in their immediate self-interest, which is pay, which is an increase in their wages, you know? So it's like, yeah. Um, yeah. That, that idea of using the, the state as an intermediary very much negates that social element of 
battling with your with your co-workers say against the man yeah well i mean i think the thing is too is it's, it, it makes sense that the left has become more concentrated in this because the left of course becomes the class that administers most of this too i mean the whole thing about social programs is that it needs a um a class of of state actors to administer them and, and the point is not you know it's not really a sort of characteral sense in which like you know it's that sort of thing where you know schools are prisons and um uh, you know like you know your teacher is as bad as uh you know the uh, as, as a cop it's really it's the the thing about it is is more that what ends up happening is that as you enter into the state the state has its own interest and it's it's a raid against society i think this is the thing that that, that leftists simply can't grasp because they assume oh well once the workers party you know becomes the leader of the state that subordinates the state to the proletarian movement and you know it's uh, that it will that's achieved through, you know, institutions like Soviets or other, I guess, sort of uh, cooperative institutions that, in a sense, kind of, I guess almost in a sense, bring democracy into the state. I think that's the logic that, you, for instance, that you see, I think, in, in Lenin's State and Revolution. And the, 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 it seems to just sort of, it doesn't quite cohere, it doesn't grasp that the state, because of these, the way in which the, the antagonism between state and society works has its own interest that's involved and when i say own interest i don't uh, it sounds like i mean monolithic there's there's a one singular interest but i mean that the state institutions that the the involvement of being um part of the institution that manages social antagonisms itself has a interest in uh, those social antagonisms that in some sense gets invisibilized it gets removed from the picture so it becomes almost as if the state is a sort of a uh, it's an instrument to which which can solve these problems rather than it being a actual incubator involved player obstacle even even when it's supposedly being administered you know from the left quote unquote grant yes i was looking at something in the i was looking at something in the communist manifesto that david reminded me of there's quite a few things cuz i actually initially i pulled up a pdf of the communist manifesto because i wanted to see this one quote, you know, there's there's a lot of talk when we're when we're trying to talk about some of the early works, right? That a, lo a lot of this anti-politics thinking comes from. Um, there's a lot of talk of oh, that's the young Marx or something like that. And I was just looking at a quote from Engels from 1888, right, where he calls he he's explaining, and Marx and Engels weren't really that interested in warring about whether communism or socialism is a better word or anything. And in fact, they use them interchangeably quite a lot. But he's he's articulating why why did we call it the Communist Manifesto and not the Socialist Manifesto? Well, in 1848, he says that whatever portion of the working class had become convinced of the insufficiency of mere political revolutions and had proclaimed the necessity of total social change called itself communist. Right. So that's the young angles uh, when he's 67 years old. Right. And then, um, you know, the, the, the young Marx of 1871 says about the, the Paris Commune that the communal constitution would have restored to the social body all the forces hitherto absorbed by the state parasite feeding upon and clogging the free movement of society. By this one act, it would have initiated the regeneration of France. And I mean, you think of those that language, too. The regeneration of France... Like, if you think about the way the left talks about society today, wouldn't you think the free movement of society would be a reactionary thing to them, actually? I mean, you know, society's bad. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's interesting because the immediate response, too, I mean, uh, it's ritualistic at this point when the left goes into an election <laughs> and, and the results are, uh, you know, devastating. The response is just like, you really see the mask slip, I guess, because the utter contempt and loathing for the societies in general that they live in it just becomes palpable and it's, it becomes no surprise really that that they'd have no credibility when they claim to be acting only in society's best interests i think what's, what's strictly struck me too with the response at the the particular vehemence of the response with the results of the uk election it goes beyond simply despair. I can certainly understand pain and agony at the result. But, I mean, pain, may I say, too, for many who voted Tory, 
mean, I think it was it's sort of interesting to see a lot of the, um, it's anecdotal, but reportage of people, of workers who for the first time in their lives, and they did something they never, ever thought they would do, and backed the Tory party. It's, you know, I mean, in some ways, like, if, if workers are doing that, I mean, the, the first thing, like, the thing that strikes me is less about them being reactionary and more like, good Lord, like, what if, um, how could things be at the stage where working class people, even against their, their, it's even against their own, I mean, they even, it's not like they did this, it's not like enthusiastically, you know, and, and fulsomely feeling like they're being represented by the conservatives, but just find laborism just absolutely intolerable and and i think fundamentally arrayed against them like and i think like this election really brings it out i think in some in just the most stark way because labor i mean and this is the difference the only the, the, the difference between 2017 and and now is just how clear it had become that the labor party had been captured by forces that wanted to countermand what had become i think at this point this is the important thing uh, when Brexit first happened, of course, um, it was only narrowly decided on. But what's happened since, and is that, and it's fundamentally underwrites the vote in the first place. Though the left has always keeps continually wanting to cast the vote as being about a, a little Britain nationalism, it's always been about sovereignty in relation to the political sphere. And why now you have such a massive, like why you've had such a crushing defeat is that slowly over time, as the political class is, is argy-bargied and so clearly conspired to try and overturn the result, it's become more and more a matter of, yeah, believe it or not, principle, that people in, uh, like basically understand that their social self-interest is in society having sovereignty over politics. In some ways, the fact that the Labour Party could position itself or move into the place of being the leader, because obviously the Tories actually themselves, have, you know, I mean, this is exactly why May experienced a collapse in her vote that, that gave the illusion that Corbynism had struck a chord. There's a sort of sense in which the Labour Party had basically manoeuvred itself into the, the position of being the leading force of trying to countermand a social assertion against the political sphere. And you can see the results. I mean, they're devastating. And this is the thing is that fundamentally, because the left particularly does not want to accept the anti-politics as anything but a reactionary reality, if it exists, and so in other words, a crypto right politics, or alternatively, if it isn't a crypto right politics, it's a, it's a, it's a phenomenon that is only manipulable or ultimately buttresses the power of the right. Because of that, fundamentally, they're missing an action. So, I mean, the only force that does try to do something in relation to it does tend to be, you know, pretty disproportionately come out of that side of the political sphere. But it's an exploitation of that thing, is it not? It's like an exploitation of the pure weakness of what is left of laborist societies. And they see it. They, they know oh, what it is. Yeah, absolutely. And they press the buttons on it. Like, the problem is not so much like Brexit. It, 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 in different countries, it'll be a different time bomb. There are different time bombs in society. You know, if mm. England has the empire and all that stuff in its baggage and they just throw a lob of grenade in there into the working class, exposes the lack of any social thing left in any of these cities and towns and just boof. But I think the thing is, is that at the moment, one thing is that I guess for a long time, like, I mean... One of the big questions we might ask ourselves, and certainly as you, you sort of progress through various forms of disillusionment with left politics, you eventually will come to a question of asking, well, what's happened? Is there a real movement anymore? Has, I mean, I mean, this is the sort of thing that usually ends up producing a kind of discontinuation of people with radical politics. Certainly a lot of Marxists reach the end of their, reach the end of their radical tether when they come to this point and usually shift, you know, into some kind of, laboristic, left liberal or social democratic, you know, accommodation with um, things as they are. But the question you might ask is, well, is there a real movement anymore? And because the thing is, what anti-politics does is it actually says, yes, there explains where the real movement's gone. It's gone into, it's gone into this fundamental, and you can see it's worldwide. It's not even just in the, it's not even just present in the, um, the core capitalist countries. It's worldwide. Where, yeah, where you have these obvious metrics of political negationism through voter participation and things like that. Yeah. 
what do you mean by that, Grant? Grant, what do you mean by that? Because like the the the, the votes have been going up in places like UK. At least in the United States, we've seen decade and decade and decade of the votes going down. I think that the third period, the Clinton, the Blair and all that period, they were going down. But since the crisis, they've been going back up in most countries. Well, it depends. I mean, for example, I just read that. And of course, it's, I think it's probably one of these things where it might be too early to tell. I'm not sure. Like, I don't have to finalise the results. But, they, but apparently this election actually is down from last election. This one is down, and and it's interesting you say that because the reason we we like the, what actually happened to the vote in Northern England where Labour lost all their seats. You look at say the in in Labour seats in London. Uh, typically in London, some of them were in the seventy low seventies mm. is the turnout, and in Northern England in the towns that they lost, it was only in like fifty two percent, fifty percent. So it's like there was a whole swathe of there's twenty percent of the electorate that normally would turn out basically didn't bother and it wasn't like so much a surge to the Tories or the Brexit party a lot of it was people just stayed at home well, but, but, but okay I'm sorry sorry to, to the sort of but this is always the thing right it's even the case with Trump and it's it's on it's an ongoing thing where basically the combination of a switch and usually a fairly narrow switch but a switch that's then monstered and treated as if it's you know a reactionary turn and a collapse in turnout an abstentionism or a negationism these two things interact to produce these results and it's interesting that like and the thing is i just wanted to to to, to focus on something though with anti-politics it's not necessarily the case that their anti-politics only plays out in abstaining from voting or refusing to vote rather what tends to happen and i think it, it often accounts for why we do for instance see sudden spikes as well as um um, well, what, what do you mean by spikes, by the way? Like, for example, with, with the Brexit vote itself, uh, am I correct about that? I think I might be wrong about this. Was the Brexit vote itself, did it see an increased turnout relative to the elections? Yeah, massive. I think it was a, it was 80%, I think. Yes, I thought so, right, yeah. So, for example, with the Brexit vote, there was something actually that the whole point of intervening there, right, the whole point of actually stepping in, invited an anti-political. Like, it was because it was a, a rose the question about the relationship to politics. And likewise, I mean, in terms of increasing on the other side, it also raised the, the social antagonism because many people in society remain attached to the political sphere. And I don't, I would not want to, um, I actually don't think it's useful. I think it's very, I think it's political reasoning itself to, to cast the division between those who are detached from the political sphere and those who remain oriented towards it as being one between you know, emancipated versus reactionary. The consciousness sort of flips the consciousness raising thing, whereas the, the you know, the consciousness is raised of, of those who have rejected politics and, and it's benighted of those who haven't. I think rather what it is, is it's got, it remains, it's all about material interest still. So, I mean, I think the thing is the Brexit vote itself being so narrow, what it really indicated was that up until maybe, for instance, if it had been held a year earlier, maybe even... Oh, no, possibly maybe even six months earlier, it's quite possible that it would have fallen just under or would have just, you know, fallen either just short or would have just, you know, been 50-50. Like, it was very close. And I think it's got a lot to do with the fact that a, a critical majority, a critical mass had been reached where a slight majority of people in the UK no longer could be convinced or felt that they had any material investment in the uk and in, in the eu and it's funny because a lot of these so like there's a fo- there's a lot of focus on the ideological you know the reactionary ideas supposedly around the eu that led to the vote but i think that a lot of these these i think a lot of these uh, rationales tend to actually follow in the wake of being of being materially detached so let's put it this way if you're in kind of what like even among i'd say probably these the areas that that labor has lost in this election i mean they would probably uh, offer an excellent example of, for instance, material benefits in everyday life, for example, of like, for instance, being able to use the international travel privileges that the EU supplies. Mean nothing, really, in practical sense to many, many people in these kind of working class areas, because fundamentally, these formal freedoms have never been anything that they could avail themselves of. And, and so it's sort of interesting that, like, for them, if there's no material investment and you're floating free, well, of course you'll pick up rationales that post hoc, in some sense, like explain or try to justify why you know you're hostile to something that you have 
pretty much no investment in. You might be indifferent to it for a while, but if you begin to feel that it's actually part and parcel of a political, like especially that it's structurally crucial to a political sphere that is, is so so clearly oriented against you, well, you know, you start to solidify. Well, they did, you know, there was all that stuff of we pay like a huge amount to the EU budget every year like 20 billion so we could keep it at home you could imagine that resonating with societies and parts of england that are essentially they're just desperate places depressing places to live well i mean i think the thing is too is that it's it, even if because like, i think the thing is then you know like the left sort of mocking you know sardonic response will be oh well if you think that you know that that money will actually go to you you, you know you're dreaming so which is like as if that's an argument that it should go to EU bureaucracy, but like you know, like a but setting aside, I actually don't necessarily know whether it would be assumed or or that there is a sense in which by asserting social sovereignty over the political sphere that it will become more responsive. Maybe there is, and certainly, if, and certainly, I suspect that if there is a a belief that you know that reining the political sphere in and making it more responsive to Britain as a country and as, as a national unit that there's going to be a change in that, like it's going to be um, a more responsive political class. Well, a greater sense of disenchantment is to come. But I, 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 I sort of think that the, the, the point is sort of like all the emphasis really is much more negative about trying to sort of like, as soon as, 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 as it becomes clear that the political class in bulk wants or finds its interests placed in a certain arrangement of things, you, it, it firms up society regardless of whether it thinks it's going to benefit or not, to negate it and oppose it. And it's partly why, for instance, you know, with someone like Trump in the, U- in the US providing such a perfect vehicle for this, it's why you see this gap between approval or support of Trump and actual personal approval or personal opinions on him. It was particularly at the time of the election. The fact that he was actually less popular than Hillary Clinton, um, just barely, but was, and yet could win meant that there was a large amount of people who voted for him who actually didn't like him personally. And of course that would be, you know, the, 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 the arguments were trotted out, oh yes, well, they voted along lines of white solidarity and they, they, was, they voted along lines of sexism and so on, you know, but in actual fact, maybe it's the fact that when it comes to refuting the political sphere, the questions of like what benefits me in a positive sense aren't necessarily, or the priority, or I was about to say, Maybe in the sense, the actual refutation of the political sphere is itself the positive self-assertion. And in fairness, if you look at the last 10 years, right, has it not been the case that it's effectively disrupted overall the ability to pursue reform? So long as Brexit's been go- reform in the quote-unquote sense, you know, like in other words, further attacks on the working class in an organised, coherent sense. I mean, it's interesting that like throughout the Brexit period, right, they've been derailed from being able to pursue their big dreams and policies. And even now with Boris, I suspect with this massive majority, I think that there's this great fear that the Tories now will be able to pursue, you know, untrammeled conservative ideological ends. I mean, all I can say is if they do, I suspect that even with their ma- their, their massive majority, they'll turn out to be weaker than May's minority. And I actually think that under Boris, actually, the whole point with Boris, uh, why he... Um, Wait now, say that again. You mean in society they'll end up being weaker because the country will just explode? No, no, no. I mean that that basically, right, if they try and govern in that manner, uh, they'll crack up. Just like you saw the Republicans crack up. Oh, oh, yeah, when they tried to take away even just reverse Obamacare, for example. I mean, that went well. Or even, for instance, when they tried to introduce, when they introduced their tax, their, their signature tax policy, which really in the end that became a, 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 like, even it looked like it might fail. And the fact that they passed it really in the end became much more about the existential question of whether the party would even be able to hang together at all. Because if it can't vote through tax cuts, well, then it doesn't exist as a party anymore, fundamentally. But it's interesting that those tax cuts were completely different from anything that the Republicans have done in this sense before, because there was no offsetting there was no, no offsetting savings, quote unquote, i.e. the attacks on the welfare state, which would you know usually be the, the gazetted fund to pay for these tax cuts, they didn't happen. So in some sense, what's interesting about Trump is because Trump's direct personal self-interest was in those tax cuts being passed. His direct personal self-interest wasn't necessarily, though, that the, gutting the welfare state to pay for it. And so you have this situation where these tax cuts actually passed, but without any weight, like any factored in 
fiscal conservative means of covering the cost of them. So, like, even when they, they, they've tried to implement, like, or they, when they have successfully, quote, unquote, implemented aspects of their conservative orientation towards political economy, it's been in this weirdly ideologically deprived and self-delegitimating. Like, they, they actually have lost authority to some degree through, through, through doing the very things that, like, through pursuing their agenda as best as they can. And I guess the thing with what strikes me about Boris is that pretty much, basically, Boris has done the political class in, in Britain a massive favour. He saved it for itself. Because if it had kept going along the path that it was going, I mean, we saw we caught a glimpse of it. And in fact, that's what galvanised, seems to have galvanised Johnson and kind of focused. I mean, interestingly enough, he, I mean, he's a curious character because despite all the things about him being, a, you know, a buffoon and, you know, a, a very, like, petty and narrow-minded, extreme reactionary. He's actually fairly, uh, in symbolic terms, he's very good and he understands the importance of culture war in maintaining a certain image. But in actual policy terms, he's actually a very, like, socially liberal Tory. So, like, he might denounce, for instance, the Burka as wearing a mailbox, um, like, you know, but then at the same time, too, his actual pro pragmatic policy option is it shouldn't be banned. So it's like... Right, right. Boris will, Boris will go... Well, of course, we live in a free society, but blah, 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 burkas, right? So it, it actually is a way of, of rationalizing to both the party center for the Tories and the party's far right that we're not actually going to touch this because it's toxic. Yeah, I mean, it, so the interesting thing I find about him, though, is that so basically what he did was when this – so you had this moment when – the two-party system became a four-party system. I mean, it's actually quite remarkable. The Tories came fifth in the EU elections. I mean, it's, in some ways, you almost wish that it had happened because that, by the time, so this is exactly it. This is why, in some ways, Boris is so, like... I mean, if there's any reason to hate Boris, it's really for this, for, because he actually managed to save... Like, he's actually managed to pull off a temporary uh, stay of execution for the political class in this respect because... That moment when the Tories and, and the Labour Party as well became effectively, I mean, they were just crippled as dominant forces and really were probably probably both on their way down the gurgle hole as like as political outfits. Basically what the writing was on the wall, particularly for the Tories. And in the response to that, Johnson basically has realised that whether the political class likes it or not, they have to do Brexit. It's as simple as that. And they have to do it in convincing enough a way that it actually looks like, at the very least, that they're, they're maintaining the pretense of ceding to society on this front. And that's what Boris is really doing. And he'll, the, the actual Brexit he'll negotiate, I'm quite sure, will be, you know, not that much different from May's. But what will be different is the way in which, and this is all been, this is what Get Brexit Done has been about. His whole pitch since he's come to power has been about. It's about this sort of play acting or this this sort of sense that I understand and I'm going to lead the political sphere in subordinating us to your wishes. On this episode, you heard the theme tune The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist research and podcast collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit and Swampside Chats, 